Hi. This is the Philosophical Angle, Defining Concepts in Current Media. And I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. And these books are available free online for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are my panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Also with us is Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and he's retired from the investment banking industry. Welcome, guys. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts and topics in current media and offer an explication of, of its essence. This week, the subject concept and topic in media is QE3. Is it good or is it bad? First, let's start by saying, what is QE3? Well, it's quantitative easing. Another word possibly would be adding money to the economy. OK, so let's just go into an explication of the Fed's thinking for why it wants to add money at this point in time to the economy. So we'll just go through what, it, what it's doing. First, it's doing it to the New York Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Second, the bank, Federal Reserve Bank, buys mortgage-backed securities. It can also buy treasuries, treasury bills, treasury bonds, anything that the treasury uh, uh, is for sale. And it can also buy from the banks and brokerage dealers uh, any, any of the mortgage-backed securities or treasuries that are out in the marketplace. So it pays money for these securities, which go into the possession of the Fed. That leaves free the broker-dealers and other investors or the Treasury, U.S. Treasury itself, to take its money that it just got from the Fed and invest elsewhere. Well, where might some of this money go? Naturally, uh, investors, if, if the uh, Fed has come in and bought their bonds, particularly right now it's the mortgage-backed securities that the uh, Federal Reserve seems to be concentrating on. So it takes these assets into the Fed, and the, left, and the money from the investors then go to other things, like stocks, other bonds, corporate bonds. What might this do to, the, uh, to these bonds and stocks? Well, as the bonds, as the, as the availability of bonds dry up, their price goes up. And naturally, their interest rates on these bonds go down, which is the ultimate purpose, I think, of why the Fed is doing this, to help lower interest rates. And probably their thinking is that this will may her, uh, spur economic activity, particularly in the housing industry, to keep mortgages, uh, mortgage interest rates low. It also might have a, another aspect in which stocks may go up in price. So the interest rates fall. This may be good for commerce and good for the housing industry as the demand for their T-bills and mortgage-backed securities increase. Let's go to uh, some further notes.
because we're going to need to determine whether this is good or bad for the economy. One of the possibilities is that as they add money to the, uh, to the marketplace, what does that do? Just adding money to an economy has some repercussions. First of all, if we add money, uh, we take the sum of money. The sum of money is equal to the gross uh, domestic product, which is the sum of the transactions in an economy, in our economy. That is, the sum of the transactions is really nothing else but the sales of all the production of goods and services in the U.S. economy. And production, the essence of production, is the sacrifice that individuals and companies make in producing a service and a good. And that is a sacrifice of the company's or individual's uh, effort, its time, its information and knowledge within an atmosphere of risk. And if it's a product, you have to add in material. So we can take all the money in the economy. Let's represent all the money in the economy by X, X amount of dollars in the economy. That means that $1 is equal to one portion of the total production of the goods and services in an economy. And let's write that down as RITE, our risk, our information, our time, our effort, and our material prime. So that's, we'll make that equal to one US dollar. And that divided into the total production, we the number of dollars in circulation. And we should know that, that the essence of all money is production. Without any production, there is no value in having money in a, in, a, in a society at all. So, but with the advent of production, and, uh, money is a tool by which uh, we use uh, to replace bartering and thus helping the economy to become more efficient. So when we get the, the quantity of money, from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has an influence on the interest rate and the quantity of money that it can put into an economy. And thus, we have to ask the following questions. As you add money into an economy, as we notice, if this goes up, the value of this individual dollars goes down. Well, if you're a saver in, a, in an economy such as ours, when the Fed adds a lot of money into the economy, inflation, uh, is a, there's a risk of inflation, and the risk, definitely a risk of your value of your dollar going down. So who benefits from that? Well, the savers of society will certainly not benefit. They'll be paying, their, their, the value of what they've saved is being diminished, whereas the, as the quantity remains permanent. However, the government may benefit because the government will be paying back their loans that they make, the Treasury comes in and, and uh, goes out into the marketplace and creates a bond and sells it to investors. They get the money, and they have to pay that money back in the future. Well, if they're going to pay it back with cheaper dollars, then they're making out pretty well. So possibly, the Fed, although an independent 
organization, theoretically, sounds like they're in cahoots with the government presently. Another uh, aspect that would lead me to believe that is presently when the Fed is buying these uh, new mortgage-backed securities, they're not paying any interest back to the uh, uh, the Treasury is not paying any, any, any interest to the Fed. Uh, so they're really getting it free. It's just like a free loan. They're just strictly adding money to the economy. So is this good or bad for the, uh, for the economy? Is it good and bad for the stock market? Let's go and ask our panelists, Rick and Mark, what they, ha what they think about this situation. Guys, Rick, I'm going to start with you first. Well, I'm very thankful to the Chinese uh, because uh, they have about $3.3 trillion in reserves, as I understand it, and through the process of sterilization, it costs them about, I don't know, 4% plus uh, in interest on every for every treasury bond they buy. And so, you know, they're doing us an enormous favor. They keep our interest rates at uh, illogical levels, given the risk associated with the increasing risk associated with treasury bonds. Uh, and so, as an American, you know, I think it's all wonderful. <laughs> Very good. Mark, any thoughts? What's the question? What's that? What is the question? Whether you think this quantitative easing is good or bad for the American economy. Well, the American economy has lots of problems, uh, and one of them is not high interest rates, which usually is a problem for an economy. So this is all just smoke and mirrors to distract us from the real structural issues that are plaguing our economy. And in Bernanke's, you kind of make an excuse for Bernanke. He's just doing what he can to try and help. He doesn't have the power to pass laws that would either reduce regulation or encourage business formation. The only thing he can do is drive down rates even lower to an even riskier position, but he can't do anything else. When you've got Congress deadlocked, when you've got a socialist president, you can't expect the economy to rebound. So Bernanke is just uh, abiding by the old truism or the old suggestion. Don't just stand there and do something. You know, you know guys, uh, he did it for a reason. What do you suppose being, let's put you guys in his shoes. What would you have done that would have been different? Um, I think he, he did do it for a reason. He wants to keep his job. Okay. So you think that there has been a, uh, a some communication between the White House who uh, may appoint him next uh, his during his next term. Uh, and I don't think there needs to be a communication. I think he knows that unless he gooses the stock market, uh, there's a risk that Obama won't win the election. And I suspect, given what Republicans are saying about Mr. Bernanke, and it's not terribly complimentary, that he's likely to be fired if Romney is elected. Okay, uh, right. So, you mentioned that the stock market may go up. How would that be possible just by adding some money into the economy? Because Although it's driving, it, it's driving uh, well, it's not just the stock market. Commodities prices are, are, are going to get used, too. As we've seen with the other quantitative easing exercises, if only temporarily. Uh, but we saw the stock market run up in anticipation of the announcement just last week. I was very happy. I sold a bunch of stock. And so, yeah, I, I think it's wonderful. But that's a very short-term yes. thinking. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't that? Go ahead. Uh, all, all else equal, 
uh, financial asset, which is all stock is, it's just the net present value of futures trading earnings, all else equal, if you discount it at a lower rate, will have a higher value. So Bernanke has explicitly decided to buy mortgage tax securities to drive rates down in that area, which will spur uh, housing construction or formation or house sales or whatever. Uh, at the same time, when rates are low there, that will push money into the stock market and further create a bubble there. Okay. So, uh, so the stock market going up from a quantitative easing, it's temporary, not really permanent. And it seems so temporary in nature that it almost seems like it's not even worth it to do it at all. What do you think, Rick? Well, I think the timing is very interesting. We have, what, less than two months before the election? Right. Uh, so if you're going to do it, make it effective in terms of affecting the election, now would be probably a pretty good time. Chris, this speaks yet again uh, to you know the democracy, the God that failed. We have such short time horizons in this political system that the most important thing that these politicians can do for the mo for the American economy is to look at all of a month and a half to, to November and see how that's going to affect the the, the, the wallet of Joe Sixpack and how he might vote in November. A monarch, by contrast, would look at multiple generations and be concerned as to what he was going to hand off to his heirs. These guys are looking out about seven weeks, and if the damage occurs after they're reelected, it's irrelevant. They'll be happy because they're still in office and they can still try to execute all of their perverted plans. You know, also, um, the, uh, the, fel the Federal Reserve balance sheet has grown uh, dramatically um, uh, since 2008 or 2009, and obviously due to the tremendous amount of spending by the U.S. government, which requires uh, uh, them to borrow the money through the U.S. Treasury by making bonds and selling it into the marketplace. Is this, is this action, and now, and now of course it's, it's, uh, it's subsidized by the Fed, which is, uh, as reported in the journal by an uh, article by um, uh, uh, Phil Graham and John Taylor, that, uh, um, that they, uh, and I'll quote, the Fed allowed the federal government to borrow a trillion dollars without raising the external debt of the Treasury and without having to pay net interest on that portion of the debt since the central bank rebated the interest payments to the Treasury. Uh, it would seem that this is just straight adding money, and of course inflation would have to take place. But yet the interest rates haven't come up to, uh, haven't started to budge yet, like they did in uh, 1978 and 79. Why do you suppose that is? Anybody have any thoughts? Well, I think, you know, the velocity of money is, is obviously muted. Um, and you could say, you know, Phil and uh, uh, Professor Taylor, I, I read that same article, well written, of course, smacks of sour grapes. Um, they're such conservatives. Uh, and one might argue, what's to worry about if the United States is well and truly in a position of being the um, safe harbor for the world. Uh, the Chinese and others will always want to buy our bonds uh, in any quantity we issue them. And so why would there ever be a, a situation in the future where we would actually have to um, sell our bonds more cheaply and therefore at a higher interest rate because the Chinese and others uh, suddenly have some sort of aversion to what the real value of those bonds is or our ability to service them. Okay. Chris, you know, there used to be a saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And if you had said that in 1912, everyone would have nodded, nodded their heads in agreement. And today the sun does set on the British Empire. So I think Rick was being sarcastic when he said, why would anyone ever buy anything other than U.S. bonds? And, and right now that's true. But one day there will come a time when perhaps they want to buy, I don't know, Swiss francs or Chinese bonds. 
And when they do, we will have inflation unleashed in this country uh, that will be earth shattering. I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. And uh, I'm doing everything in my power to remain hopeful because it's not pretty. Right. Um, you know, the consequences that, uh, uh, that you're referring to, uh, you know, I, I think are probably related to what Rick said about the price of commodities are, is already starting to rise. Gold is starting to rise. The U.S. dollar, uh, the US dollar index is starting to fall. Uh, this is going to cause the value, of course, the value of the dollar is going to buy less. Oil would then consequently, and, and, and uh, as being a commodity, would go up. Will this take a toll on the U.S. economy here in the short run? Uh, we're all worried about a possible recession. Does this action actually increase the chances for a recession uh, happening in the uh, near and, and, and midterm future? Anybody would like to give us uh, some thoughts on that? What do you think, Rick? I think um, recession in Europe's already upon us. Uh, in Japan, it's already upon us. Um, the Chinese economy slowing down. I think you know that that horse has left the barn. Uh, so the U.S. will be in recession next year. Okay. Yeah. Mark, what do you uh, think? Chris, I would argue. Go ahead. I would argue that we already are in recession. The last unemployment statistics indicated that the labor participation rate is the lowest it's been since 1981. Infl uh, the employment rate has been flattish, but that's because people are dropping out of the labor force. And I think when numbers get revised in six months, we'll look back to today and say this is where we entered the recession. Yeah, I, um, I, I tend to agree. And uh, I think that uh, as this uh, situation unfolds here in the, in the short term, I think really that with uh, in, uh, commodity prices increasing, uh, because it's uh, um, because of the additional dollars, uh, these commodities will go up in the very near term, as we've seen already. Gold has moved, uh, and follow, and it'll soon be followed by oil, and that'll have an impact impact on the immediate economy, because you'll have less to spend. And I believe that uh, last year the uh, I think I read that. Uh, the median income in the United States has already fallen. Uh, and, uh, and your comments about a recession, I think, improve. Well, improve I should, is probably the wrong, way, uh, wrong word. The, uh, well, household net, household net worths have taken it on the chin, and median income is kind of flattish, which isn't good because median income should be growing over time. Mm-hmm. So uh, the commodity. So uh, I think we all agree that this is an in a recession-inducing action by the Fed. Uh, was there any positive? I suppose the only positive one is the lowering of interest rates and the temporary ev uh, valuation of the individual stocks going up. Is that about the only positive effect compared to the? Uh, uh, the detriment of a uh, uh, or of its consequences of an increase in commodity prices across the board was it worth well, it just, for them? You, you just be long bonds. You're you're a hero. If you're long bonds, you're a hero. That's right. Well, it also lowers the cost of servicing our debt to external parties. So, I mean, if you're in the mood to stuff the Chinese, and I, you know, I don't think the Americans are too fond of them anyway. It's wonderful. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay, because Rick's in Seattle. They're going to get him before they get us. <laughs> right. So um, possibly uh, we could go back to uh, one of the conclusions of the article by Graham and Taylor. It said that rationing decision-making comes down to a comprehensive measure of cost and benefits. The Fed's, effort, the Fed's effort to use monetary policy to overcome bad fiscal and regulatory policy long ago reached the point of diminishing returns. I think that what we've said here today echoes that very conclusion. 
Does it not, guys? Rick, do you think that their conclusion of Gra Graham and Taylor is commensurate with ours? Yeah, I think uh, that was true uh, after QE1, never mind QE3. And uh, Mark? Yeah, that's, I mean, great, mind thinks, great minds think alike. We agree with them. Okay. okay. Lastly, in the last paragraph of this article, they state, the Fed softened the recession by its decisive actions during the panic of 2008. But the marginal effects, uh, I'm sorry, but the marginal benefits of its subsequent policy have almost certainly been small. We may find the, that pol the policies that had little positive impact, impact on the recovery will have high costs indeed when they must be reversed in a full bone expansion. So what they're referring to here is that the Fed may, once things get going, as you said earlier, Rick, that this, the, the money hasn't really gone anywhere because of the velocity of money is so low, it remains at the banks. But once the economy gets going, they'll have to come back in and take this money out. Will it be fast enough, do you think? Well, that idle money, from my, what I understand, only amounts to about $9 trillion. So, you know, as much as, in as much as Bernanke felt that the housing bubble was not going to burst, I think, maybe six months before it actually burst, I'm sure he'll get this one right, too. I, sus I suspect some sarcasm going on here, uh, echoed uh, by a nod from Mark. Uh, uh, so but Bernanke, but Bernanke's omniscient. Like, there's no doubt in my mind he's omniscient. I see. OK. As, as has every Fed chairman been. OK, so. I am, too. I, think, I am, too. Let me just add that. So Rick, I, Rick, Rick, I knew that because I'm omniscient. <laughs> So I think we can conclude that this try by the Federal Reserve has been promoted by politics and nothing there has been promoted is in, in thought of the good of the American economy and the American people. It's really short-term political move and a disaster at that. I want to thank you. The first is a disaster. What was, that? what was that? Democracy is a disaster. Don't limit it to the Fed. Yes. So, yes, something we can discuss next time. Rick, any final, uh, any final comments? I think Mr. Bernanke, like Mr. Greenspan before him, has earned his place in history, and I don't envy him that. Okay, guys. I want to thank you for joining me. It's been a... Uh, an ironic recording full of, uh, of some good sarcasm. And I want to thank you for coming. And this is the Philosophical Angle. And I am Chris Angle. See you next time.